This is the Money Seed Podcast, where we discuss all things investing, plain and simple, the way it should be. Please remember, this show is for educational and entertainment purposes only and is not intended to be investment advice. Welcome back to the Money Seed Podcast. I'm happy to host Mr. Shlomo Freund from the Free Financial Self website. And Shlomo, welcome to the program. Awesome being here. Thank you very much, Gabe. Thank you for inviting me. Yeah, it's my pleasure. So Shlomo has been a financial coach, an investor, and an all-around digital nomad for many years now. And uh, Shlomo uh, will talk to us today about his favorite type of investments on how individuals can become more geographically independent, more of a digital nomad, how you can take control of your finances and help plan for retirement and help lead the life you want to lead. And yeah, Shlomo, kick us off. Um, Tell us a little bit more (laughs) about your background and how did you get involved in financial coaching? Sure. So uh, let's start that... uh... I am. I studied in school electrical engineering, very much related to finances, of course. Um, but um, the, the the true story is that since I'm I'm at a very young age, the first part, the first section that I read in the newspaper is the financial section. I've been really interested in that since a young age. So let's say eight, nine, ten, something like that. Uh, so it somewhere always was there at the background. Uh, as I said, I, I became electrical engineer, but for many years now, I'm not been doing that and been doing other things. And about five and a half years ago, I started with the financial coaching. Um, I had a partner taking over a company that uh, I had. Uh, I had a time. It was time to say, okay, I want something, a kind of a, a passion project, something that I really want and love to do. And that was, for me, uh, combining um finances or investment but also uh travel so helping people for me it's travel so it's, it's kind of helping people to really understand what they really want for themselves in life and then make that happen through their finances it's not so much about money for the sake of making money but how you attach that to your life goals that's that's my that's my uh way of thinking about these kind of things and these kind of investments so free financial selves basically combining these two combining my passions. Amazing. And that's very similar to how I got started in investments as well, in the sense that I'm an engineer as well. So I'm a mechanical engineer. I worked as a mechanical engineer for many years. And then after the 2008, 2009 economic crisis, I kind of left engineering. That was just not a very good place to be at that time. But Mm -hmm. yeah, people who study engineering or math or many of the hard sciences, it's, I always feel like we we have a leg up on the competition. Like it's much easier for us to understand finances because we're naturally good with numbers, right? I mean, yeah, we spent somehow. years and years. Somewhere and... always there. <laughs> That's right. Like even as a, as a teenager, you know, I was good with numbers, which is why I went into engineering. But if somebody is good with numbers, they're, they tend to be drawn toward finances and investments because it somehow the numbers tend to make sense. Yeah, but I think it's it's also important to say that the basics of finances and to really succeed with that are not, it, it's not rocket science. I mean, it's still achievable for people who are not good with numbers. Uh, this is also something that I try to teach and show my clients with this because, you know, people are afraid of Excel sheets and people are like, I don't want to touch my money. It's numbers, my bank account, stuff like that. And that's not true. That's really not true. You can't, it, you can't make it accessible for yourself with, with little learn, learning and a little bit of courage, I, I, I'd say, but it's not too bad. I agree. Absolutely. Yeah. And it, it shouldn't be scary, right? I mean, it's like you said, I agree with you. It, and maybe I didn't come across because if, if I tell people, oh, no, you got to be an engineer to be good at investing. That's the wrong message. No, no, you don't, you don't have to be an engineer. Anyone can do it. Um, so tell me, outside of having a job and making money, what were some of your first investments? So my first first investment was within around eight, nine, or ten. I was um, uh, exchanging Israeli shekels for U.S. dollars. I found out in the newspaper they have the exchange rate, and I just uh, exchanged my two dollars for I don't know six shekels. And then the other the next day, I looked at the newspaper the exchange rate and decided, okay, let's now uh, decide if I should exchange that or not. And I would tell my parents, oh, I exchanged today, and then write a little note. So that was my first one. Uh, fast forward many, many years. 
Uh, my favorite investments now are, are digital assets, so uh, content websites and things like that. Uh, they're kind of unusual, but for me, they're the most interesting and very lucrative. Um, so it's not the usual things. It's not the usual stuff that people see, to say the least. And Shlomo, tell us a little bit more about, because I think the word digital assets can mean a million different things, right? Um, right. NFTs, crypto, and I think even some of the investments you just mentioned might be something different. But when you hear the phrase digital assets, what does that mean to you? I agree that when you say digital assets, pe people think about Bitcoin. And I do have, I do hold some Bitcoin, but that that's not what I refer to. So I, think about uh, a website, either a content website or maybe a SaaS. So it's kind of a software solution for some kind of an audience already making money. And you are coming in and purchase and buy that website or buy that business. And then you optimize it and you improve it just like you're, you're doing a real estate uh, uh, flipping. So you can flip websites, you can flip SaaS, uh, things like that. So that's the way to look at that. So when I'm saying digital assets, I'm mm -hmm. talking about these, these kind of things specifically. Uh, however, these can also be uh, other things. So think about um, YouTube channels that are related, that you know that you are able, maybe in your niche. Think about uh, the Google Chrome extensions that somehow can fit in your investment portfolio. This can really go anywhere. Think about like, it's kind of Lego pieces. Maybe you have something and then you can buy something and fit it over there and then fit this and kind of making this uh, m and that would be a smart thing to, to move on with your business and the things that you do with those digital assets. Does that make sense? It makes sense. I'm just, this is maybe the first time I'm ever hearing that there is an active open market somewhere out there for things like blogs and YouTube channels and Chrome extensions. I mean, as an individual, I know where I need to go if I want to buy real estate. I know where I got to go if I want to buy stocks. But um, where do you go if you want to buy some of these assets? There are many um, marketplaces for that. Okay, not as many as, you know, uh, the stock exchanges. <laughs> but I know of at least 20 places that you can go. So there are platforms like um, Empire Flippers. There are platforms like, there's a platform uh, called Motion Invest. Um, I'm just going to try just trying to think from the top of my head. Um, but you can also find this in private Facebook groups intended for that for for website flipping. So if you if you search on Facebook website flipping, you're definitely going to find about around uh, four or five or six of those. Um, there are newsletters about that. And at some point, you also get private deals because people know you're looking for stuff. So they just get in touch with you either over Facebook or Twitter. And I also post my Twitter account saying, um, if you have a digital assets to sell or abandoned blog or website or something that let me know, I might buy it from you and people approach sometimes. That's amazing. And so what was your first deal in digital assets? Like what was the first time you thought, Hey, you know what, this, this blog looks interesting or this YouTube channel looks interesting. How did, how did that first deal come about? The first one. Oh, so I read about that. Okay. So the main marketplace that, that let's say the most well-known one is flippa flippa is a marketplace for everything digital and th that can be either websites but it can also be just domains um and years ago i looked on that it's like uh, that's kind of too scammy i'm not sure I'm, i, I want to do that um and over time they got improved um and then i kind of looked at it again and i found uh, a reliable marketplace that's empire flippers so they do more due diligence on the assets that they list on their marketplace and they also help you uh, move the asset from the seller to the buyer uh, you of course pay a premium for this but that, that that's in some of the cases worth it um, so i started researching on this and after around four or five months i was ready to make my first acquire uh, and that happened uh, in December 2020. So four or five months of, you know, really going back into this um, and then making an acquisition. And that was a, a rather big website for me. I'm still holding it. Um, then about a year afterwards, I bought another one. No, not even a year. 
less than a year afterwards. I bought another very small one. I already sold it, by the way. That was not a successful acquisition. <laughs> I lost money on that one. Um, and about a month ago, I bought another one, which I'm very happy with. Uh, and that is uh, a quotes website. That's that's my new acquisition, which Amazing. I'm very happy about. Sorry, what do you mean by yeah. quotes? Sorry. Uh, quotes, uh, um, um, sayings. People post their oh, own sayings. Yes, not like uh, pricing quotes and things like that. Oh, I see. Like quotations, like literature. Yeah. Yes, but not famous ones. So people who are uh, putting their own quotes kind of want to be remembered for things. So there are a lot of artists there and, and authors and, and thinkers and philosophers and, and things like that. Just the other day, I... I uh, <laughs> I, I I I looked at the how people define their profession there. So most of them are students, um, but then there are a lot of artists and stuff like that. And I think some of them also made a joke. We have thirty miners over there. I don't know how. <laughs> so uh, anyway, for me, looking at data is kind of a fun thing. So it's like, whoa, we have these, we have these. <laughs> that was fun. Amazing. I like those. Amazing. Um if this website is accessible, uh, would you mind sharing the URL? I'd love to. I'd love to check it out after the show. Yeah, sure. Would you like to me to say it? Yeah, say it now. Yeah, and I'll add it to the show notes as well. Sure. It's ownquotes.com. Ownquotes.com. Got it. Yes. Sounds good. Yeah. Thank and you. And then about uh, I think you mentioned roughly five years ago, six years ago, Shlomo, that you started a company called Free Financial Self, where you offer yeah. mentorship and coaching. Tell us a little bit more about how you started that, why you started that, and. Um, what has your journey been like? So it, it all started from, as I said, kind of combining, let's say, good lifestyle and, and finances and how, how I help people achieve that. I feel that for us as a location-dependent family, we really live in our own term. We, we terms, we go, we, we go on vacation. So let's say two to three months a year, we are able to, uh, to travel and just work and live remotely. Um, and I wanted to help others do that through finances. And I had one company and suddenly I, uh, uh, I had a partner taking over that company and I had the time, okay, what I'm going to do. Uh, so I started free financial self. My wife came with a name and basically I offer, uh, one-on-one -on -one coaching for clients. Uh, and then I can, if you want to talk about the roadmap of, of what exactly I do there, um, and I also started doing uh, an online course and also workshops and and um, and uh, I even have a financial coaching group. So that's a monthly one, uh, kind of a, a, a subscription based, uh, where the aim is to help people to increase their net worth every month by one percent. That's the goal of the group. So coaching them toward this. So that's kind of twelve ish percent a year. Uh, not too bad. You can do better. Um, but that's that's my my part that's what i'm aiming for for the members yeah and i would say 12 percent per year is very good i mean even long term if, if someone can do that long term they will do very well yeah with the say... website by the way you can do more than that mm. with the website it's much more than that uh, with, with these kind of of, of uh investments um but yeah it, it's a portfolio it's not like all my money is in websites of course right right and what does your typical client look like so i i mainly i I don't meet client clients face to face. It's mainly people who work remotely. Mm -hmm. um, so let's say remote workers, and now it's a term, but before COVID, it wasn't. Um, so it's definitely changed things because I aim for people who, but like remote workers, digital nomads, if if you know the term. Uh, and suddenly, everybody are <laughs> remote workers and digital nomads, kind of. Um, so so. And these are usually not starters. So they, they either entrepreneurs already have a business that, that is working and they have some extra money there and they want to go to the next step. Okay, what do I do with that? Or they are uh, in a company, but mid-management and they kind of, or maybe they just got a promotion. So again, what's the next step? What's the next level for me? And I want to align my finances with my desired lifestyle. So what do I do? What do I need to do? Get me to that step. So... I, I take them through uh, on my program through four steps and eventually at the end, they have a plan for the next 20, 30 years of what they need to do today, every month 
what to invest in what assets and what returns in order to get to all their life goals. Uh, understand uh, the things that are really important for them. And I'm not talking uh, only about college for kids or buying a house, like the usual stuff or retirement fund. That's there, but that's, in my opinion, not the most important things in life. The important things in life is maybe having your trip around the world that you want or uh, going to Italy for six months or buying a sailboat. So let's see how that goes in your blend of let's say life investments finances so i help them achieve those because i want that to stay in their plan and not will be stay for will not will, will not stay for someday one day we'll do that we'll do that it never happens eventually and shlomo when when your clients approach you and say shlomo i need your help usually what age group are the clients that you work with oh uh, i'd say the 30 to 45 30 to 45, yeah. right. Or, yeah. or late late 20s to 40, 45, yes. That, that's the age group. And do you have clients who are, I've, I've always been fascinated by the digital nomad lifestyle. I always thought that was really cool. Um, is it possible to do it with children? Oh, yeah. It's possible to do it with children. There are more and more people who do that with children. We meet them on the road. I just stopped a, a few months ago, spoke at, spoke at a digital nomad conference in Bansko in Bulgaria. And there were several families there, although I, at that time I traveled by myself. So I'm happy to see more and more of those. And people think that once uh, digital nomads think that once you have kids, your travel is finished and that's totally not true. So I want to encourage people to do that. Even if they have kids. I'm happy to hear that. That's good stuff. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And without, without mentioning names, of course, but if you can talk generally about some of your clients, what do you think? Some of the major, <clears throat> excuse me, what, what are some of the major misconceptions people have about finances or what are the most common mistakes or incorrect assumptions people have when they approach finances and financial planning and pursuing their goals? I think people need to understand they need to take more responsibility over their finances. They are, you are the person who cares most about their finances and money and their life, of course. Yes, you can outsource that to the advisor at the bank or find someone to do that for you, but it won't be the same. Still, it doesn't mean that you have to do everything by yourself, but be in charge of your finances and money and then at least know what questions to ask, how to uh, uh, assess a person to help you with your finances, whatever that is. But people are kind of, I'm hands off, that's money. And I just don't accept that. I just think it's wrong. It, it just just by taking responsibility, you'll make so much money over your life because of that and save so much. And why not? That's my approach. I agree. If you would have to take a guess, would you say that the easiest way to help somebody is to lower their spend or to increase their income? <laughs> so I have uh, a thought. I can't answer straight, straight straightforward with that because I have a, I have a talk called that I give, and it it the title is how to know what to invest in, and the gist of it is that it's so individual that you really need to go through a whole process, the roadmap that I mentioned, um, to really understand that. So on on on. On the process that I'm taking clients, so first I help them understand what is their, what are their life goals, what they want for themselves. So remember that uh, trip around the world, sailboat, and also college for kids, okay, or a house or whatever. All that is in there, but they need to. I, I help them talk about this and realize and understand what's the, the important things for them in life. Then the next two steps. So step two is upgrading your financial knowledge. So understanding what is net worth. What is cash flow, compound interest, all the basics, but they're really achievable for people who are not, doesn't have degree in economics or are engineers. And then I teach them, go ahead and then now track those things. Do that monthly. That's the third step, controlling your numbers. And then at the very end, it's the plan that I mentioned. How do I take all this data into a cohesive plan that will work for you for the rest of your life? So you know what I need to do today to reach all those things. Does that make sense? Absolutely. Absolutely. And you're right. It does, 
for it to be successful, I understand, yes, it has to be a broader, more holistic approach. And it has to be tailored individually to each person. Yeah, so I can't choose any of, of, right. of A and B of what you said. Exactly. It depends. <laughs> <laughs> no, but you're right. Everyone's temperament is different. Everyone's risk tolerance and approach to you know money is different. And it's it, there is really no one-size-fits-all approach. I Yeah. Yes, exactly. Exactly. Shlomo, can I ask you, uh, what are your, if you have any thoughts or outlook or opinions on some of the major investment classes that we mentioned before, for example, when you hear the word Bitcoin, right? Um, just for the record right now, we are recording this in November, 2022. What are your thoughts on Bitcoin? So when I am supposed to say that's not an investment, run away. <laughs> no, I'm kidding. Um, it's part of my portfolio. Uh, people, as long as you're comfortable with uh, an investment that you have, that's okay. As long as you're sleeping well at night, that's fine. Just so you'd know that in terms of Bitcoin, yes, you see the vitality. So take that into account. If you're okay with that, do it. If not, if that's too much, don't do it. And and, and that goes for anything, for any of the assets. If you're not, if holding a digital asset, it's too much for you because Google can ban you and the website can go down in, 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 in the day, don't do that. That's fine. That's okay. So th that's the main thing to consider. So I understand most people would go to the obvious things that they know of, you know, stock portfolio, real estate, things like that. Then the high risk takers, according to their risk tolerance, would go with the other things. Got it. And how do you determine a client's risk tolerance? Is that something you can gauge by asking a few questions or having a discussion? Mm -hmm. So I, I really go into understanding a client when I'm 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 working with them. I, I get to know them and I I help them or I present to them their options from my experience. So everything that I did before or doing are things that are open for them. And I know I, I have the access and I know how to do that. And I, I'm of course I'm being very transparent with them saying yes you can do that but da 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 um but there are some, you know, basic things that pe you, people can can hone into and, and do when they when they start. So as an example, if you have a long-term goal, uh, let's say 10, 15, 20 years from now, and you want to uh, invest monthly for that or even yearly, let's say that. So going with a simple ETF on the S&P 500 doing an average of 7 to 10%, depending on how you count, a year... That's a, that, that's a viable strategy to go. Of course, no no hundred percent success there. Can no guarantees, but we do have statistics of one hundred years, right? So you you can work with that. So so do that, and that's an easy thing. But yes, you have to be ready to go with the ups and downs on the market. People now are looking at their portfolio every day and like saying, oh, "I can see, I cannot see that." Just don't do it, okay? Just go through the storm and and, and keep going. So so it, yeah, um, just by talking with people, you understand. And when once you explain the risks there, they can then tell, okay, that's okay for me. That's not okay for me. I just now have a client which I'm uh, introducing to her to website investing. She's very interested in that. Um, but first, before we go to that, she, she's on my yearly plan program. And before we go to that, she said, I now have money, but it will take a few more months for me to really get into things and until we find the assets and all that. So, okay. So I taught her, okay, let's go open a, open an account with a broker. But let's find the right ETFs for you. Let's do those transactions first. Put that money to work for you. Then when you get your yearly bonus, let's go for the next thing. And this is the, that will be the next step for her. Nice. Yeah. And I can see how this can be a, it's a long process, right? This is not something that you just, you make some decisions in a few months and then all of a sudden, boom, your financial goals are achieved. Like this is a, generally oh, speaking, it's a long process. Yeah, It's a long process. Um, I do, so I have this uh, intensive plan where I'm going through that roadmap that I mentioned. And this one is about two and a half months and they, they come up with a, come out with a plan and then they can go and, and you know, uh, work towards because now they know what they need to do. Um, 
however, as you say, it's a long-term thing and then things come up and yeah, things change in life. So for that, the yearly program is better. This is why I started doing this also, you know, we have this intensive two and a half months and then for the rest of the year, I'm, I'm holding your hand towards whatever we decided the plan is. Let, let's work towards that. Let's execute. Mm -hmm. But it's a long-term thing. That's correct. People want quick fixes though. So yeah, that's a challenge. They do. They really do. Yeah. Especially here. I find that here in North America, um, people do have a little bit of a very short patience, a short fuse, right? <laughs> you know, they sign up for a program, they want results right away. And and unfortunately, or fortunately, but finances, it's, it's much more of a long-term outlook. You got to look decades ahead and think about where you want to be and what kind of steps you got to take to get there. It's a, it's a long haul. As a financial coach for me, it's it's challenging for me to speak with new clients because of their, you know, <laughs> short-term uh, seeing of the, the results that they want. And kind of sometimes people don't understand that they have a problem. And that's very hard to convince somebody who doesn't see they have a problem. Well, yeah, why, why do I need you? like these these kind of things so it's kind of you need to find the quick fix for them to to let them to for them to understand oh okay that helped me okay what's the next step and then what's the next step and then what's the next step Shlomo I want to take this in a slightly different direction if you don't mind I noticed on your website that uh, you spent some time in China you have a company in China I believe it's called app in China um, and the, I've seen some customer uh, testimonials on your site from China. Tell us a little bit more. How did you end up in China? How did you become the owner of a company in China? Sure. So I'm not involved with this company for for uh, quite a few years now. Let, let's say this. Um, um, so it starts in 2007. My brother-in-law decided that uh, learning Chinese is really important. He, he wanted his kids to know Chinese. Um, and I joined them for studying Chinese for two months in China, in a, the northeast of China, in a city called Dalian. And that's where my China thing started. Fast forward to 2010, uh, I got married and then... About a year after we got married, we decided, yeah, how about we move to China and see how it is to live there? Uh, because we kind of thought, okay, we have nothing specific in Israel right now that you want to uh, stay for. So I quit my job. Uh, I don't remember if I, my wife had a job or quit her job or whatever it was back then. And uh, we moved. We moved to Beijing. Uh, we lived there for three years. Over... Those three years, I became one of the, um, let's say, community leaders of entrepreneurs in Beijing, the foreign ones, not the Chinese ones, and became very involved with the community. Um, and I didn't plan to open this company. <laughs> However, uh, a friend came from Israel and I brought speakers uh, to, to that. Uh, it's a, it was a meetup group. I actually still have that group, but I don't have the meetings anymore. Um and he spoke, he came to Beijing and he spoke at, the, at that event. And after the event, he said, mm, I see that you're really not, you're not really sure about what you're doing. How about you try this? And this is what up in China, uh, basic services still is. Um, just have a page with an offer and a buy button and see what happens. <laughs> and after two months of research and, and building this, I had a page with a buy button and an offer and it started by i i, I managed to get a few uh some uh publishing coverage from from uh, uh local websites and that started bringing the first clients so i and then i just sat on a chat but let's say the whole day and just chatting with every starting to chat with every person going into the website uh i don't remember what service that was but I just started a conversation, understanding what they need and helping them. And this is how the first clients came in. And yeah. basically, we, we help with, the company helps with uh, foreign companies to distribute their mobile apps in the Chinese market. So it's a one-stop shop for operating your app there. That's amazing. I'm always, I'm always uh, inspired by stories that start simple, right? Like you talk about, you had one site, like one simple website with a page and a buy button. 
and it just grew from there. But I always, I always admire businesses that start from very simple, very um, humble beginnings. That's 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 a cool story. Um, I asked uh, specifically about China because I also lived in China. And it's funny. I mean, this is going to sound scripted, you know, to somebody listening to this. But okay. I was I used to live in Northeast China. I, I, I lived in Shenyang, which is okay. maybe a two hour train ride from where you lived. Um, and I lived there from 2012 to 2015. So. OK, I was in Beijing. Yeah, we have so, <laughs> two years overlap. Yeah, I know. So I have many, many stories from China and uh, I always Amazing. have interesting discussions with people about China. Um, so that's really cool. I think you and I will have to schedule another another uh, interview some other time in the future and we can talk more specifically about China and our experiences there. But I could talk all day about China. Would so love I, that. <laughs> would love that. Thank you. <laughs> yes, uh, Shlomo. So um, as we move to, uh, to kind of wrap up this interview, um, what's the best way for people to get in touch with you? So the best place would be on my website. That's freefinancialself.com. I also prepared a tool for the listeners who are interested in kind of starting this journey of the roadmap that I mentioned. Uh, and this is how to calculate your net worth and cash flow. It's, there's a whole uh, uh, Google spreadsheet there. And that's on freefinancialself.com slash seed for, for your listeners. Um, except of that, I'm at every social media platform. So my free financial self on Facebook or my name, LinkedIn, my name, at Twitter is Freud Shlomo. Uh, you can add that. YouTube is free financial self. What else I'll miss? Instagram is free financial self. All those I'm there. I'm very happy to speak with listeners. So get in touch. Really. I'm very happy to talk. Excellent. Thanks, Shlomo. I'll put all that into the show notes. Um, any personal uh, financial books or YouTube channels that you can uh, recommend? Yeah. Any any one of your favorites? So I love the mon your money or your life, which is not so much about um, it's not so much about investments. It's more of finding this sweet spot of uh, life finance balance of defining for yourself what is enough that you are happy and able to live sustainably for the rest of your life. That, that's the one. I, I forgot who the authors are. I always forget to be honest, <laughs> but your, your, um, your money, your life, that that's the one. And so, so say the name again, your money or your life. I didn't catch the name. Uh, yes. Uh, hold on. I just have uh, a blackout. Your money. Yes, your money or your life. That's the one. I like it. I like the name already. So I'll definitely have to add that to the show notes as well. Sure. Shlomo, if if you so can find it, uh, I'll send you a link later. Sounds good. Shlomo, thank you very much for your time today. I really enjoyed our talk. And hopefully we'll have you back on the program in the future. Same here. Awesome. Thank you very much, Gabe. We'll be in touch. Sounds bye -bye. good. Thanks. Bye-bye.